probably. Um, because, uh, I don't know, like, they're just a bunch of kids out there. That is true. Um, however, would you adopt the kids if they had big heads, creepy blonde hair, and creepy glowing eyes? I'm <laughs> Even more so, okay. to be honest with you. Well, then do I have a movie for you that we're going to be talking about today on the Spectator Film Podcast. Hello, everyone. I'm Max. And I'm Austin. And you need to answer your own question now. Oh, uh, would you adopt a spooky child? Are you fucking kidding me? No. Why? I No, I don't want children in general. I'm a clusterfuck of mental and physical health issues. I do not need to pass that shit on to another generation. Clearly, these kids are self-sufficient, is the thing. <laughs> so you don't even have to feed them. They're just like a Roomba. You know, you just let them go, and then they can do whatever. Yeah, but they're probably going to kill me in the end. Like, let's be honest. Not if you make yourself useful. And yeah. I probably could make myself useful. And listen, unless they want to know, like, 101 facts about the making of Repo the Genetic Opera, like, these kids aren't going to find me useful <laughs> sources of information. Just try to teach, teach them, like, jokes. Yeah. Be like, hey, kids, how does Moses make coffee, huh? Hey, kids, do you know Zydrate comes in a little glass vial? Like, um... Did you know the answer, Max? He brews it. Yeah. He brews it. I, I'm glad that you he, found your... He brew? He brews it? You're 101... He Jew brews it. You're 101 Jewish jokes. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Mel Brooks, please write that book. <laughs> Mel Brooks, please. Oh, God. We um, love you. But yeah, we're doing uh, the 1960s <laughs> film Village of the Damned today. Not the John Carpenter one, as I originally thought when Austin suggested we do this movie. Yeah. Even though I hadn't seen the John Carpenter one, it was just more fresh in my mind. Yeah. I saw this a bajillion years ago, probably like 15 years ago, 18 years ago, 30 years ago. Um, a long time ago. Yes. Um. And I had retained almost nothing about it. There was a couple scenes where I was just like, oh, right, this one. But other than that, I had remembered nearly nothing about it. Um, I did think it was longer. This movie is very, very short, which makes it very easy to recommend to anybody who kind of wants an old spooky movie. Yeah, it plays much like a Twilight Zone episode. Like you're saying, it doesn't have like, except for maybe the ending and a few other moments, it doesn't have like a ton of super memorable scenes per se. Um, but the concept is really strong. You know, it, it, it's just like a solid fun hour and 15 minutes. No. And it, it falls in with, um, cause this is based on a book. Um, yes. Meredith Cuckoo. Yeah. The Meredith Cuckoos. I want to say the midwitch cuckoos. Cuckoos. Um, cuckoos. It's based on a cuckoo bird. That's cuckoo. It's not the, called the cuckoo bird. It's it is in this movie. <laughs> cause let me tell you, all these guys got cucked. Am I right, Max? I It'll hate, be the next joke. I, I hate you so much. <laughs> anyway. I thought you were just being a regular idiot, but no, you were being a double idiot. <laughs> anyway, continue <laughs> with your. Uh... <laughs> yes, but the author wrote this and um, my second favorite plant based horror film. Uh, Day, Day of the, the Triffids. Yeah. 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 <laughs> um, so you wrote that and. Uh, was named the Mandwich Cuckoos because um, cuckoo birds will lay their eggs in other mm -hmm. birds' nests, and then those eggs will hatch and either destroy the other eggs or push those hatchlings outside of the nest mm -hmm. so they get all the attention, which is very similar to the children in this. Although they they kill remarkably few other children in this movie, only a couple. It's always the f like more implied threat of like yes, wait until they hit puberty. You won't fucking believe what happens oh then. Oh my god. <laughs> all that pale white hair village of the of damned everywhere. the college years <laughs> <laughs> oh man just a porky's remake except it's village of the damned yeah <laughs> what a weird fucking movie that would be um we don't need to think about that um but yeah so would you it sounds like you have a pretty like neutral history with this movie yeah. like you enjoyed it it's like spooky good halloween vibe it was one of those movies i watched like when i started enjoying horror movies and kind of just faded from memory yeah and i'm glad you brought it up again so i can revisit it but like i would recommend it to people but like i'm not gonna be like yo dude if you need if you're getting into horror this is one of the classics but like if you have an hour to kill and you want to watch something fun from the 60s like can't really not recommend this at all it's very solidly made and incredibly well paced like yeah it never feels like it's slowing down at any point 
Yeah, I would agree. I I think my history with this movie um, is a little bit shorter. I watched it a few years ago for my horror project, um, as is the case with many horror movies. And um, I just thought it was sort of similar reaction to you at the time. I thought it was a pretty good sort of atomic era type of horror movie. Um, you know, it plays like an allegory in some ways, like some of the characters are a little bit closer to stock characters, but the performances were decent. And um, I don't know, I just think the concept is very strong though. Um, and I understand why someone might feel the impulse to re remake this movie because it could be very sensitive to change with context and, and like a change in history and location. Right. Although even if the John Carpenter one, isn't that great. Well, apparently John Carpenter had a miserable time remaking it. So really? Like, yeah. He just did not enjoy it whatsoever. I can tell you the movie feels kind of lifeless. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but I totally understand why someone might do that. Um, because the concept is just really engaging. Um, and I think, you know, this movie is, even though, like you're saying, it's maybe not the most absolutely riveting or frightening I thing, I think it has an important place in like a canon of horror. Cause it is something where it's like, you're talking about the idea of like kids in horror, which there's this, there's a bunch of movies that use kids as this scary image in horror as like some sort of antagonist, right? Oh yeah. The Omen being the most like probably famous. Yeah. yeah. And uh, I think this movie is a key sort of um, milestone in that type of horror. And that's something we're definitely going to talk about in the commentary track. Um, but I do just think it has like, you know, fun, spooky vibes, you know? And uh, no, I, yeah. I, I completely agree. Um, this movie also falls on a very short list of movies that have a fair amount of child actors and none of them make me want to kill myself. So that's that's quite an accomplishment. Yeah. And... I would say a fairly strong lead performance by George Sanders. Um, yeah, I think he is very much almost sort of a relic at that point. Cause it's the sixties now, but mm -hmm. like this feels like a fifties movie almost to a fault. And he does feel like sort of a relic of the leftover, like strong male logical hero from the fifties era monster movies. Something that I think we talked about too, with like hammer yeah. and their sort of patriarchal, heroes and those patriarchal authority figures. We're going to be bringing up probably those comparisons a lot in the commentary track. And I, I'm glad you brought that up too, because I feel like him being someone who is sort of part of a more bygone era is something the movie is slightly aware of in accentuating his age. Right. Um, and it's interesting to look at that as a type of like, you know, atomic era allegory of like this new generation coming up. That's totally different than their parents and it's causing anxiety. Right. And uh, Fucking I just think baby it, boomers. <laughs> yes. Little did they know how right they were. <laughs> they just merely missed on the whole hive mind and like, you know, they should have eradicated all the children is the point. <laughs> yeah. We could have like skipped a little bit. Um, <laughs> yeah. Go straight to Gen X. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It'll be fine guys to work. Um, but yeah, no, we can skip Gen X too. I don't need Pearl Jam. Like, I think we can do without that. Yeah, seriously, Gen X people on Twitter. Even flow. All you people talk about is how no one pays attention to you and how you don't care. On but then the you talk about it. like butterfly. <laughs> what the fuck is this episode? Uh, I don't know, but I think we're going to have a grand old time doing it. Let's go. All right. Oh, look at that lion. I love the lion. Look at that real ass lion. You don't get that anymore. Come on, Metro Golden Meyer. Here we have pastoral England. Or wherever the fuck this is. It is in England. Is it though? Is it in England or some other part of the UK? No, it is England. We're dumb Americans. We don't know this. No, they they don't have the Scottish accents or the Irish accents or the the whaleish accent the, the gibberish that is welsh <laughs> sorry to any of our welsh listeners but get a better language come on man <laughs> <laughs> gaelic is hypnotizing to lis listen to you you need to up your language game honestly also as long as we're starting with just stupid comments can i just ask what the fuck is up with that pie with the fish sticking out of it where in England, it's just another oh. one of their dumbass foods they got. Well, because England conquered half of the world looking for spices and then decided they didn't like any of them. So they, <laughs> just, they just made the shittiest food possible. We're going to put fish in a pie. The only good cooks in England are the people on the Great British Bake Off. Like they, they found all 10 of the people. 
in England who are good cooks and put them on that one show and just had Noel Fielding be charming around them. Oh my God. Look at George Sanders here. Performance of a lifetime. And he just pretends to have a stroke. Yeah. That would be pretty fun as an actor. Don't you think? I remember, uh, did you ever have when you were in high school, like your teachers would have you act out Shakespeare plays or anything? Yeah. Um, I remember I was playing, I was like reading off a Romeo bit and it was the point where like I drank poison or whatnot. Yeah. And I so convincingly fell on the floor that I scared my uh, English teacher in class because I thought I had actually collapsed. But like I, I, I did a fake fall or like I, I didn't get hurt at all, but. Maybe maybe I should have followed that call my freshman year Romeo performance to be an actor. You could have been instead. a stunt performer. Yeah. Maybe I should have. No, I couldn't have. I've I've hurt myself way too many times. An to eight year st- old Arnold Schwarzenegger could be throwing you through a window right now, no. but instead you're recording a podcast. What the fuck did you do? I've dislocated my shoulder and gotten like five different concussions. <laughs> Speaking of stunts, I'm gonna say that this stunt with the tractor here stealthily impressive. Yeah. All of this is nice. This, this movie starts off strong, though. It doesn't It doesn't spend any time just being like, oh, hello, I'm Detective Jenkins, and this is what I'm here for, and how are you doing, Miss... No, the people instantly start falling asleep. Yeah, that's so, another reason why it does play a little bit like a TV special, maybe in a good way, though, to me, is that it begins with the event. You see the star's face for two seconds, just to be like, yes, George Sanders is, in fact, in this movie. We did not lie to you. <laughs> and uh, And then we begin with this magical event where they all fall asleep. And it's very creepy and inexplicable. I was telling Austin during our uh, pre-screening the other day that, and we're going to avoid making too many Twilight Zone comparisons because every review or retrospective on this movie you see brings up the Twilight Zone a lot. Yeah. But there were a lot of Twilight Zone episodes that didn't like, some of them did have very beleaguered messages, which is good. You need, you need messages in your show. Sure. But some of like the more weird Twilight Zone episodes were just like, wouldn't it be fucked up if this happened? <laughs> and wouldn't it be fucked up if this woman had a pig nose? I mean, wouldn't it be fucked up if you like were an astronaut on a planet and you encountered two dead bodies and then walked around and found out they were your dead body? Right. Oh, Max, you just spoiled it. Spoilers for an eighty-year-old TV show. <laughs> um, but like this movie kind of starts off like this. I, I yeah, do, I do think there is a bit of a political message to this movie. Sure, and that may just be paranoid leftist me nowadays but it does kind of feel like there is there is a bit of xenophobia in this movie and i'll get into that later yeah of course i would definitely say that this movie in terms of its politics is it winds up being conservative and reactionary against sort of this idea of this younger generation and we may limit ourselves on the twilight zone comparisons but i think that a movie we could compare to that we've also done on the show is them. Yes. One of my favorite movies of all time. Yeah. And I think it's, it's pretty similar to them in some surprising ways, especially if you look at the comparison of the kids directly contrasted against the ants as like that other. Right. Um, And I, I think, I think this movie deals with it in a more sophisticated way. Like there's a little bit more ambiguity about the, the status of the kids otherness than there is about the ants, which are just like, you can just dismiss them as like, they're totally evil in that. And then at least in this one, there's like, yeah, there's never a question. Like, there's never like the scientist in them is never just like, would the ants truly be a better ruler for earth than we would? Could they learn to be my son? Yeah, like there's there's never a moment where like they question the ethics of burning the ant nest. <laughs> yes, <laughs> they're like, no, we need to destroy them immediately. Yeah, but could could us humans be evolving into smarter ants? No, there's none of that. Um, no, I think this movie does have reactionary when they, when they remake them eventually because they're going to. You know they are. I don't know that they will. Eventually they will. We have to remake every movie that was moderately <laughs> successful. I'll remake them and I'll call it those. That was the, in Fallout 3, there was a quest involving giant ants that was called those. Uh, <laughs> damn it. Fuck you people for stealing my idea. Fucking pathetic. God damn Before it. I had it. God damn it, Tal- yeah, Todd Howard. How dare you? <laughs> you fucking cuck. Yeah. I'm okay with calling Todd Howard a cuck. He's a piece of shit. <laughs> oh, Max. So we haven't mentioned any of the people that have showed up on our show before, as we should do- be doing, right? Um, because these are our friends. These are our actors that we've dealt with. Hello, Gobby. Hello. Two people who have been on the show before, Michael Gwynn 
and Peter Vaughn in this scene being this funny ass English cop who's just got a bicycle and no car. <laughs> Um, I love this scene because he's just like, oh, well, I was heading in the same direction as you. And then he just drives up. <laughs> yeah. Not like, oh, help me. Let me give you a ride. Fuck you take your bike. And then they just see the the bus that has driven off the road. Yeah, was five feet up like they don't yeah. have any vision. So they drive five feet forward and they're also, like, oh, there's the bus. People in the UK. Are those cop hats really that tall? He looks like a fucking cone head. Oh, no. People in the UK just have heads like that. And that's why they wear. <laughs> They just don't want us to tell us that. That's why they have the gigantic crowns in the royal family. They're yes. trying to hide their cone heads. Yeah. That's why the English people always have weird hair. <laughs> We're figuring this out. Can't hide it from us forever, English people. Ooh, we are both big fans of this shot, by the way. It's so interesting. Do you see how it pans? It's like it's hard to figure out where the camera is actually like planted and what angle it's holding towards the ground. No, it almost it uses the bus to create an artificial Dutch angle almost to make you uneasy. Like, yeah, and it almost looks like the angle is the camera lens itself is wide enough to make it almost seem like barrel distortion on the lens. So it's like extra confusing. That shot singularly is really interesting. There aren't a ton of shots in this that really stand out to me, but that's one of them. But yeah, we had Michael Gwynn and Peter Vaughn in that one scene. And of course, another person who is appearing from other movies we've done here on the show is uh, Barbara Shelley, who last appeared in our Gorgon episode. Uh, What a wonderful film. Yes. And uh, interestingly, she's also in this movie, uh, much like the Gorgon, playing host to something that will, in a certain sense, contaminate and possess her sort of yeah but she doesn't die in the end of this movie no spoilers sorry this is the part where i'm like really we're just going straight with the canary in the coal mine (laughs) approach well i think this is interesting because (laughs) that's that shot is funny so we haven't really talked much so far about this movie's sort of um premise and how it works as like a type of like allegory right and i think if we're comparing to this to them the idea of like an atomic anxiety, right? Atomic age anxiety. Um, And living in a world that is like, I'm going to say post-religion in a certain sense, where if you think about, you know, in the 1950s, it's like, wow, humans really can do anything with our technology now, right? We can destroy entire nations in the blink of an eye. Um, And we're sort of discovering new things about the world that have always been that way, but it's alienating. It's like defamiliarization from the things we thought we were used to, right? And I think this movie is sort of playing with that that idea and also um, looking at all the ways in which, in a way that is more sophisticated and, and intelligent than them, looking at the ways in which this community and government struggle to actually deal with this situation. In them, it's just a matter of time. Yeah. Until the American government solves the issue. In them, it's just like how many people are going to die before we kill all the ants? Yeah. Rather than will we, can we possibly contain the ants? Or will they beat us? Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's Um, why I had a good time comparing them to Godzilla, where like Godzilla is just like, there's a good chance we're not going to beat this and he's going to fucking destroy us all. Yeah. Them is just like, no, the American military with our superior strength and planning, we can always defeat these evil ants. We just need your help. Tell us if you see an ant somewhere. We'll fucking flamethrow that bitch. We'll be there in two seconds. I'm going to say this again. If anybody still has the puppets from them, even though they're 70 years old now, if if you want to... They don't exist. I'm sorry. I I can hold out hope, Austin. They're just made of like cardboard or something like that. And then they got wet one day and they're just over... The stuff from Jurassic Park probably doesn't exist. I know. If say, if somebody wants to recreate me a puppet from them. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. But anyway, I think this is interesting because in this movie compared to them, them, I think we talked about in that commentary track, how it does that scaling thing where it's like, oh, it starts as like a communal problem where someone goes missing and then it like zooms out, right? And it becomes like, Oh, the state problem. And then it zooms out further and it's like, oh, the country's problem, right? And you have these different levels of like community politics going on and how they deal with it. In this movie, it's sort of the same, but it starts from the opposite angle where 
at first it's looking at like the state and military trying to deal with this problem. And then they fail miserably, right? When they can't penetrate this like cone of sleepiness, I guess. Um, but it's interesting because the ballistics fail first and then it zooms in and it looks at like an interpersonal struggle between like just family dynamics, right? Of like father figures trying to assert authority over these kids, which they ultimately struggle to do and fail to do, which is why at the end, of course, George Sanders opts to destroy the children. Spoilers. Mm -hmm. Austin, people might be watching this movie for the first time with us. You can't just give away how it ends. We haven't even seen the children yet. Fuck you. This is the funniest scene in the movie to me. Why? Because he just falls asleep? Well, it's just like, what the fuck did you expect to happen? Well, they don't know, to be fair. they At first, they think it might be some sort of chemical attack, which you would assume that the you know pilot might be a little bit safer from that. Well, they know. They send the guy in the gas mask in, and he falls asleep immediately. And then they're just like, oh, maybe he's going to pull up. And then there's an explosion in the wrong place based on the trajectory. Yeah, it's okay. They did the best they could. I'm more impressed that the pilot could even get that low without fucking crashing anyway. You know? That's a lot of smoke for a small plane. Max, don't Ding. Don't, don't shame them for their big explosion. I know. This, this movie actually had an incredibly small budget, especially for a major release at the time. But I mean, I still get the impression that it wasn't like a huge release. Um, it was a major studio making it, but still. It's, it's like a, it's a, you know, it's sort of like a group together type of movie. It's not quite like a B feature. I wouldn't call it that, but you know, it's a package deal sometimes when, when they distribute movies and then they shoot certain movies to fit a distribution model. Right. And this movie isn't a huge movie, but it does have a decent amount of money behind it. I imagine that's how they got George Sanders, which with his amazing, sexy voice. Yes. Which unfortunately we're unable to hear as well. Mm -hmm. I'm a cow. <laughs> That's a good cow actor. Not gonna lie. Because frankly, cows seem to be one of the worst animals that people hate working with on film sets. Cows seem to never do anything. And oh my God, Max. This movie also has a fantastic dog actor. Not the best dog actor, but no, that's from the thing, of course. Um, if anybody wants to challenge us to find a movie with a better dog actor than the thing, I, I don't think I you don't can. think you can. Yeah, that one shot of it in the hallway. What the fuck? <laughs> How did it do that? You know what I'm realizing though, Max? Why do cows always appear in alien movies? Because they symbolize rural, remote areas and a lot of areas that alien movies come yeah mm -hmm. take place and come in that because they're removed from the hustle and bustle of the city they're the yeah they're the true human experience they're not the people becoming cogs in a machine part and also it's easier to have your alien movie in a rural area because then the entire world isn't alerted to alien presence immediately yeah that makes sense that's just my two cents though yeah no I, that makes sense to me too also, maybe because there's a certain expectation in urban areas of like different pe people like passing through and maybe there's no like dramatic tension in the idea of like an alien showing up right at the city, maybe unless yeah. he did it a certain way. It was like an Independence Day. <laughs> Dog. The dog plays an interesting role in this movie, actually. He's the only constant throughout it, honestly. And doesn't he tell the dog to go? Oh, there's Barbara Shelley. Yes. For the first time. Doesn't he tell the dog to go, like, say hi to his wife at the end or whatever, and then it leaves? Take care of your mistress. Oh, and then it leaves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Now, this is a very interesting part. I think we can compare this movie in at least uh, George Sanders' character and the idea of patriarchal father figures to many of the hammer movies we've done but i feel like this movie is far more critical of the power of that figure and it really questions about you know whether or not this sort of traditional authority figure actually has the ability to deal with this situation um in certain ways it has 
a little bit of confidence where maybe this guy is more interested in trying to build some sort of connection with them. Of course, I do think it winds up thinking that they're evil anyway. So maybe you could say that, you know, George Sanders is wrong for doing that. Um, but I think the movie highlights his age in an interesting way because he's not only the patriarchal authority figure, but also he's like an older version of it. And it seems like he's a relic in some ways. Uh, they highlight that he's older than his wife in several moments. Yeah. And then I think in this introduction scene with them together in the way they play off one another, he almost plays like more of her father in some ways. He's like kind of distracted, not looking at her, you know, there's certain moments where he's not like, they on don't, top of the they ball. don't have the best couples chemistry. No, but I think maybe that's in a certain sense deliberate. Like there's a little bit of a dis disconnect there, but he's also older and he plays it as kind of like out of breath in some ways. You know, I think it's interesting. I think it's something to sort of re reflect upon with this movie. She's much more vivacious in this movie than he is. Dun, dun, dun. My whole village has fallen asleep. Uh, the military's coming in to secure things. Wasn't it a nice time when you could trust the military? I love the idea of the military trying to find, like, coronavirus with these things. Just like metal detectors. They mentioned gamma radiation later. <laughs> In case that any of them are going to turn into the Hulk. I guess that's another way you could remake this movie is just make it like a 50s government satire. You know? <laughs> They're just like like checking all the humans for radiation. And like sticking these instruments in their face. What the fuck is she talking about? With what? Are these people from the telephone company? <laughs> I think they told her they were from the telephone company. Oh. Now, this is woman... Is this the 1960s version of the 5G <laughs> caused coronavirus stole people? stole my fucking joke, you <laughs> son of a bitch. <laughs> I was about to say she's about to go online in her shop and post on MySpace about, like, 5G. I was going to say mom's net, but yeah, that works too. <laughs> Why do you think Michael Gwynn is wearing outfits that are too big for him? To make himself look fat. No, he doesn't look fat. He just looks nervous. Well, I mean, that does fit his character. He doesn't really have a character. He's very good in Revenge of Frankenstein, though. I thought you were going to say Revenge of the Nerds for a second. <laughs> it's just going to be like, wow, I misremembered no. that movie a lot. <laughs> That'd be very fucking weird. That's one of those movies along with weird science that I saw when I was a kid for some reason and like didn't pick up on how fucking bizarre they are. And like rewatching them, I'm just like weird science sucks. It does. So many of John Hughes things like just suck. They just suck ass. Weird I'm science sorry. is just like just such a disgusting, pervy, weird movie. <laughs> like it really is. I like the fact that the Mad Max biker is in the movie. That's <laughs> it. Um, I will say one thing I like about the movie is that when they flip the switch and then shit starts to go crazy, like everything goes crazy and the dog is like crawling on the ceiling. Yeah. Um, I also, enjoy that moment. Also, the Oingo Boingo song is a banger and better than the movie itself. I don't remember it, to be honest. Weird science. Oh, come on. It's great. Sure. I just think that movie sucks. Got any other hot takes about fucking John Hughes for us? <laughs> um... No, I, I do. I know there's a lot of backlash. I'd still enjoy Ferris Bueller and uh, Ferris Bueller is good. The, yeah, I and I I know this one has a huge backlash again. I, I do like the Breakfast Club still. I, I, I think it's for what it is. I think it's a very good movie, an example of the genre. But I don't know. It's just so weird for a movie to actually treat like I hate the ending of it. I, I hate the fact that like this the proto goth withdrawn girl has to like clean herself up and like look all pretty I, that's always the dumbest shit yeah. you know speaking of cleaning yourself up and looking all pretty 
or not at all, actually. Um, here's another interesting moment of like performance where I feel like the performance of gender and specifically once the kids arrive in the movie, the performance of childhood is a very big part of this movie. And one of the ways that I think they sort of depict George Sanders as a kind of like older out of touch, maybe husband is his obliviousness to his wife's incoming pregnancy where she's doing the whole thing, right? Where she's like, I am eating anchovies dipped in peanut butter with pickles. Yeah. Right. And he's just like, Oh, do you see this plant here? It's fucking brilliant. I love this flower. It's a plant that I put with some other plants and now it's a plant. Yeah. And she has to like come out and tell him that she's pregnant after weeks and weeks. And the, the fact that the people in the shop know the old ladies before he does is interesting to me. Um, he seems a little bit like disconnected. Right. And I feel like that sort of plays with the type of tension that the kids in this movie play off of because they sort of rely on initially a threat of like impotence to this patriarchal authority, right? I mean, we joked about this earlier, but this movie essentially is about all these dudes getting cucked, <laughs> right? That's really why it's called the, the Midwich Cuckoos, but it's not the kids. It's the parents. You really need to give up on that joke, man. I never will. <laughs> but I'm not wrong, though. As we've talked about in many of these movies and a lot of those Hammer movies, we talk about like sort of the Oedipal, Oedipal sort of cycle of character progression where the sort of um, possession is the specifically sexual possession of a female character in a movie will often synthesize with a moment where the male lead will like reach a certain point in their arc where they've reached maturity. Right. And this movie is sort of like challenging that where it's like dispossessing the men of the women that sort of sanctify and legitimize their patriarchal authority for them. And that's why the children initially that's part of why they're so threatening to them. And let me ask you an interesting question here, Max. Um, do you think that the aliens are the kids or the parents of the kids? I don't know. And I don't know if it matters. I'm not sure if it matters either, but it's an interesting question, I guess. I think we can talk about that more toward the end of the film. Yeah. But it's an alien presence that has inserted itself into this community regardless and different communities as we learn out later. That's something that's a big yikes moment for me later on. Yeah. When they're talking about the different communities these children have been born into. That's a that's a big what can I say but yikes moment. <laughs> and here's the scene where uh, the man is going to get mad at his wife for getting pregnant with no explanation. Of course he was on a trip and he just came back. So he's like, of course she fucking cheated on me. Right. That's logic. Is that what it is? Yeah. He's, he's welcome back. Jimmy says the cake. And then she told him she's pregnant and he's like, what the fuck? And he's just going to leave. I mean, frankly, he doesn't know he's in an alien movie. So maybe that makes sense emotionally for him to react that way after his journey back. Maybe he just came back from like, I don't know, working with George Lucas on, on something. And he's like, I've had a hell of a time. And then he learns his wife's been cheating on him or he thinks his wife's been cheating on him. But that's part of the interesting thing too, is that how immediately because of the way these kids insinuate themselves into the lives of these people in this community, they immediately start challenging the morality of this older world, right? Where this movie is sort of paranoid about the future generation. It's kind of like a you kids movie. Um, and it came out in a time that's perfect for that. This is 1960. I know we talked about in the um, preview screening about a, a sort of like disconnected loose cycle of films, a number of which were produced by AIP that sort of just threw the word teenager in the title for no reason in ways that make don't make sense at all because the, even the term teenager was new at this point. This is like one of the first times in history, in at least recent history, I guess, that like the idea of generation gaps 
became a thing. Well, right? back well back in the day, it's just like yeah, two fourteen year olds talking to each other. It's like oh, how your wife is doing? Oh, she died of the plague. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh my god. Oh no. The sound insulation fell on Max's head. Oh, uh, it's attacking me. The children have used their glowing eyes to make the the sound foam oh, attack with us. Mm-hmm. Kids, you don't need to do this. Our podcast sucks already. <laughs> but no, I, I think it's it's sort of scared of a new future. You know, everything about these kids represents things that sort of de- de- destabilize the norms of the former pre-existing community and their ideology and morality. And the first part of that is stuff relating to marriage, right? And the idea of infidelity, you know? I don't think Jimmy and his wife are in like an ethically non-monogamous dog situation. Yeah. Yes, dog. I'm going to say that every time he appears on the screen. The fucking ears on that dog are He's amazing. a good boy. I can just tell that by looking at him. I'm sorry. He's just sleeping most of the movie. Exactly. It's great. He's a good boy. Love her fucking pajama robe there. I love this x-ray where you can't see anything. And they're just like, look, it's a perfectly formed feed. <laughs> Max, we're not doctors. We don't know what we're looking at. But wouldn't it be funny if they also just didn't know what they were looking at? Oh, uh, you see here, this is the head of the baby. It's like, doctor, that's the spine of the woman. <laughs> <laughs> no, doctor, that's the head of the woman. <laughs> yeah, we don't see shit. What are we supposed to be looking for? Here? <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm saying. Where is it? Where's the baby? And of course, that's another way that immediately the uh, the kids start interrupting and destabilizing our sort of like normal idea of like not only children, but just humans, right? And this is where they start to be something that's related to them, their unnatural conception, right? Uh, the idea that they produce in this weird semi asexual way you know that's very much like them where they're in that movie we talked about how like they seem to be like self-replicating in a way that has no sex or gender at all and in this movie it's very much the same they they come in here there's no like sexual act in some ways it would be easier for this patriarchal authority to grapple with the situation if there was like a sexual act and if there was weird infidelity but the these alien kids immediately cross their line because there isn't even any infidelity, yeah. you know, it doesn't just violate the preexisting cultural norms. It completely like bypasses that binary completely obliterates them. And the fact that George Sanders seems to be a step behind his wife in his concern too is interesting. Well, he's like, he forces himself to be a step behind everybody else by presenting it as him being the rational one the entire movie. Yeah. Like later on, we get the military people being like, we should probably just kill them all. And he's like, oh, but science, we have to think of science. And everybody kind of grudgingly goes along with him eventually. The weird thing is that I want to agree with him in some ways. It's no, just you understand. The, yeah. In, in this kind of movie, you want to root for the guy who's just like, no, we shouldn't blow things up. We should be science. But like the kids are all just little shits who yeah. you can't trust at all. Well, that's the thing is that the movie does have those fundamentally reactionary politics. So it does kind of stack the cards against that position anyway, even though it's like, well, if we're talking about this in any sort of real ideological sense, Empathy is the way to go, you know? You can't just destroy other humans, like, because they're weird or whatever. Unless you're the Soviets. <laughs> we'll get to that later, though. <laughs> That's something I wanted to re-examine and going back to this, because I think I might have misheard the dialogue or something. But What? Cause oh, I, that the Soviets destroyed them? No, because earlier on they say that like every child born in the Soviet Union was like killed by their fathers and the moms too. And then later on they say that the Soviets nuked the town that the children were born in. <laughs> so I'm just like, wait, did they just nuke the town for good measure? Or? And then Jeremy Corbyn pissed on them. <laughs> he pissed on all the corpses. And then he ate them. He ate them in his toad in the hole. There was little Soviet boys in the hole that day. All these 
Look at that man with his sideburns. God damn. This is surely an English pub. That's like the one thing I would do in the in England. I'd like to visit the rest of the UK, but in England, I would just stop by a fucking like a stereotypical old English pub and just be like, OK, I'm going to get a drink here and then leave. leave How it. are you people in the UK surviving without being able to eat peanuts in your pub? <laughs> Isn't that all you do all day? Oh, they also have tea and crumpets. And you talk about football and they have biscuits. I don't know why we're in the position to make fun of anyone as Americans. But we can, so fuck you, the English. <laughs> fuck you. We our country sucks. We <laughs> coronavirus <have> to... <laughs> number one. <laughs> Anybody who calls cookies biscuits are fucking abominations. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> watching the great British bake off. And I think you're going to be making some like, I mean, can you imagine if Scooby doo, it was like Scooby biscuits, <laughs> Scooby crumpets. I mean, get the fuck out of here. Scoop and all Ducif, whatever his British name would be. I don't know. Gloucester. <laughs> what the fuck are we talking about? <laughs> the fuck knows. <laughs> We're drunk. <laughs> Yeah, I'm, we've been drinking way too much. I got, I got I've some, been eating since this morning. Same, honestly. Yeah. Um, we got some Dan Aykroyd vodka that we oh, had. Um, that, okay. Do we want to save that for a Dan Aykroyd weird ass movie? No. Okay. We're not, we're not doing Ghostbusters and we're not doing uh whatever the fuck that. Nothing but trouble. Yeah. So we're good. Is that Tupac's debut in it, a movie? It might be. Yeah. Uh, weird. Fucking weird. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, we got some nice uh, crystal skull vodka, which it's very smooth. We can't we can't deny it's it's very good vodka. I would love to see a faux documentary of like Dan Aykroyd being trying to be like Werner Herzog. Good dog. Where he like thinks that this actually happened in a certain village and he's trying to like stalk kids and interview them because he thinks they're aliens. <laughs> he's too busy being on the Mandalorian. Um, Dan Aykroyd? No, uh. Werner Herzog. Oh, no. I said Dan Aykroyd pretending he's Werner Herzog. Oh, okay. Doing like a very serious documentary about aliens. I'm sorry. I wasn't paying attention to what you said. Werner Herzog, too, in under the right circumstances, might also randomly harass and interview <laughs> kids. <laughs> I don't know. We start to ask them like, oh, God, what the fuck would he ask them? I, I can't even do the joke. I'm not going to pull out my Werner Herzog uh, accent right now. After drinking so much, it would just ruin it for you guys. So what you're saying is that all of these. It doesn't sound like that yes, at all. He sounds like a cartoon Nazi from a 1950s movie. No. He sounds like Dr. Strangelove. What do you think George Sanders is a scientist in? He apparently knows lots about quote unquote hair groups, but also plants. Yeah, I was going to say, he seems to be a botanist based on his like being like, oh, I crossbred this plant with this plant. Oh, here we have this scene where she's going to stick her hand in the pot. Because she spilled the milk? No, because the milk was too hot when she gave it to him. And as we see, they only ever use their powers for self-defense in this movie. Sort of. It The movie seems to suggest that they go too far. And in some moments, the movie seems to hint at the idea of like pleasure, like a sadistic pleasure, perhaps. Um, from David, I think. Who I think he gives a very good performance, that, that actor. Oh, what the fuck is his name? I should say this. That particular actor, they're very lucky they got him. Because I think you said that the you know kid performances in this movie were good, yeah. But that actor in particular is quite talented at giving um, unsettling kids performances. Uh, a year later, he would show up in the fantastic movie The Innocents as the child in that. And The Innocents, for anyone who doesn't know, is by far like the most notable sort of turn of turn of the screw adaptation or type of story in film. Um, it that that movie is fantastic. Also, I think somewhat reactionary in its politics, but it, it remains an, a beautiful, fantastic movie nonetheless. Oriental ingenuity. Yikes. 
these Chinese people really made this box fucking confusing, don't you? It's think? very hard to open. Yeah, those fucking weirdo Chinese. That's why we the English are so much better. Let's go eat some meat pies now. <laughs> Let's go eat some mud. I did not expect to come out swinging at the English so hard today. Why? <laughs> I don't know. It's always a good pastime. <laughs> what if the English done not deserve to be swinged at? I don't know. I mean, they did give us Noel Fielding, but that's about it. Sorry, I've been watching way too much of The Great British Bake Off. It's the only thing that can keep me sane in these troubled times. Do you think there's any convention with the naming here? Because we have the lead kid, if there is one, Yes, this David. movie is made by the Illuminati, and this is supposed to be David Cameron, and it's going to tell us that David Cameron is actually a lizard person, and he was controlling the British government. You did make a joke the other day about like how this is somewhat similar to like dumbass Illuminati reptilian ideas. Crossbreeding with humanity to... yeah. And obviously that was a joke, but I do think it's similar. It's interesting if you look at how paranoia takes like comparable forms, you know, because this movie seems a little bit more intimidated by like, you know, youth culture change, like an imminent youth culture that we hadn't experienced before. Um, and the idea of like different values that are totally contrary to yours. Um, in a way that is not quite towards communism, but also maybe leads that way slightly. Oh, you know? well, it, we'll get to the communist thing in that movie later. Well, I mean, I think this is actually a good time to talk about it because this is the moment they re they sort of prove their point where it's like they talk about the collective nature of these kids, the hive mind, right? Which is also num another similarity to them, you know? The idea that they do not carry forth that, like, Western rationalist and even more so than, you know... English American idea of like individuality, you know, where perhaps more so than the UK. <laughs> oh God, here we have the eyes. <laughs> this scene is just funny. My question is if it takes just one to hypnotize them, why did he go into the other room first? I think they're young, so their powers haven't completely developed. There you go. Yet. Yeah. And it shows you that all of them can do it, not just one. Yeah. And like later on, there's nothing you can do to snap the people out of it. But like we see that he can snap the mom out of hurting herself by slapping her in the face. Yeah. And the kid was able to, he was trying to escape it by going into a different room, but and as we learn later, their powers are growing because they said that they were scared of airplanes until they that's true. realized how to extend their range to be able to get them. There's something interesting, too, about like the nature of the alien's behavior. Where this movie, I d again, I think it is reactionary in the sense that it views them ultimately as like objectively evil. But it does, to a reasonable degree, try to motivate some of their actions, right? Like, he, like you said, they seem to act out of self-defense and then sometimes just go too far. In certain situations, I think it's interesting how this movie could have maybe explored more like how, why they feel so fucking vulnerable, you know? I mean, this group of kids, if you look at them, they're like highly paranoid, you know, if the milk is too hot, they're going to react and, you know, hurt you because they think you're like trying to hurt them or whatever, you know, everything about them is like, they seem to be very, uh, I don't know, intimidated by their own, like they have an idea of themselves as being fragile almost, right? So they're very secure and safe and take no chances about anything. And now we've reached, I think, the second half of the film yeah. where the kids are now sort of quote unquote grown up. And I think that's also a very interesting thing here um, in how these kids sort of, I don't know, make themselves a little bit more intimidating where it's like they do not perform childhood at all you know yeah like uh they they are totally self-sufficient and they don't need the parents for anything which is p maybe part of why they also sort of work as a type of like memento mori 
for the parents because it's like a reminder of your own incoming death and replacement by this new generation. It's like they don't even need you anymore and they're five. They're already like child adults, you know? And that's disturbing to everyone. And of course, it also that upends... Could, that could be like the... I mean, that's something you... I'm starting to see that as as the the Zoomers, as they call them, slowly get older. It is interesting to see like them be aware of social problems long before a lot of people aren't our generation were, like relative to how old they are. Mm-hmm. Um, and like that is, I would say, a semi-universal fear is just like the youth outpacing you in usefulness. Yeah. Um, but... And I can get that, but this movie is so short; it doesn't have a whole lot of time to explain or it's just expand upon that theory. You know? Yeah, yeah. And I think it, part of that too is if you're we're talking about some values that are threatened by just even in a more general sense than this movie, but the idea of monstrous kids in horror movies. One of the ones that particularly presented here in this movie is threatening is um, the idea of like upending the nuclear family right they totally subvert all the like functions of the nuclear family because not only are they self-sufficient but because they like george sanders is saying in this say in this scene they sort of asexually reproduce themselves and that's another weird thing that we sort of talked about before but um in a psychoanalytic sense at least if we're looking at this movie as you know, a type of anxiety over an impotence of the patriarchal authority figures um, and their lack of their ability to grip with this new generation and this uh, sort of deviant culture that's created because of them. It's sort of this weird incestuous thing too, semi-incestuous, psychoanalytically, of course, because the idea is that the, you know, these children reproduced without the presence of the father, right? And got between them and their wife. And then also it, in particular, the case of George Sanders, his wife is younger than him anyway, and sort of has a greater awareness of the weirdness of them, which is something we've talked about in plenty of horror movies. The idea that women are sort of like a, uh, they're considered open. That's something we talked about with Carol Clover's book a lot, men, women, chainsaws, um, and how they're sort of open to possession and the supernatural in a way that men are not. And actually, this movie em- emphasizes that even more so because uh, Barbara Shelley's character's name is uh, Anthea, which I was like, oh, oh. that's a conspicuous name. Here and we I- go. We've got a town in Australia. Oh, they're pointing out all the different locations where uh, they say there are different colonies even. So they even look at it as a type of like colonizing invasion, right? But anyway, just to finish my point, I looked up Anthea because I thought that was a conspicuous name, Right. And it turns out it is uh, of Greek origin, and it means blossom. So typical, you know, female reproductive imagery in that name. Oh, is this the scene where they said the Soviets, like, nuked the children? (laughs) No, that's later on. Oh, okay, they did say it. So the, the... The brutish, the ones closer to communist China killed their uh, children. Right. But the the the, the semi civilized Soviets, at least the Europeans. Yeah. Yeah. The semi European Soviets kept them alive and are giving them the highest education at the moment. Yes. Ugh. I would expect nothing less. That's not how mutation works, buddy. It's not just like one great leap forward. It's like a bajillion different leaps in different directions. <laughs> and occasionally but one Max, of these sticks. Subtextually, like you just said, it is all about that one great leap forward. Am I right? <laughs> Am I right now? Just firing on all cylinders with these jokes today. That's why they come here for those. That, that chairman meow. <laughs> <laughs> chairman meow. Apparently, like, that's the name the vets hate the most because they see so many fucking obnoxious hipster. Like, there was some AMA about, like, on Reddit, people asking vets, 
Like, what's the most annoying pet name you get? Chairman Meow. Chairman Meow is the one that, like... For cats? Yeah, people are just like, you're not as fucking funny as you think you are. <laughs> <laughs> Can you imagine if Mao was alive to see himself, like, turned into, like, uh, like a uh, in cartoons or whatever online, like, I don't know, like an e-girl with, like, cat ears? <laughs> He's like Chairman Meow. How fucking weird that would be. Just a moment. What was your suggestion about nuking the shit out of the town? And then they say that uh, there's a number of, like, child casualties? Well, casualties, people forget this all the time, and I get into arguments with people all this time. Casualties does not mean deaths. We like to use the word casualties during war because it inflates numbers and make you, makes you think that, like, oh, look how many people are died. Sure. Casualties means injured. So, like, these kids could have scraped knees. They could have, like, fucking, like fell off their bicycle or whatnot. But as they say, nobody's died yet. That was also your argument when you were at your tribunal in fifth grade because you <laughs> you caused so many casualties at the schoolyard. Am I right, Max? Obviously. Yeah. What? Are you sniffing? Do you smell anything? No. Oh, okay. I'm going insane then. If I have a Are you having a stroke? Yeah. <laughs> what does it smell like? It smells like the ganja. Okay, then. Yeah. Austin's smoking a big fat blunt right now, guys. Sorry. It's possible it's someone else in this building is smoking a, a fucking fat one right now. I don't know. Yeah. Who knows? Or I'm just having a stroke. You'll know in about <laughs> 10 seconds, guys. <laughs> That'd be a very interesting stroke. We're still going to release this episode, of course. One mind to the 12th power. You know what else is interesting about these kids and the way they position them as threatening is how they seem almost like authoritarian, like in their conformity, like visually, you know, they all have that pale ash blonde hair and then they have the weird ass eyes. And then, like you said, they even added prosthetics. Yeah. To the top of the heads of each actor. They added prosthetics to the top of the heads and then put, I believe, wigs on top of the prosthetics. Okay. Um so their heads look their heads and skulls look bigger to give them a slightly more alien and more intelligent feel. Right. That's like the only real practical effect in this entire movie. It's yeah. It's just like, yeah, here you go. And uh that's the thing. This this movie does almost seem to be about eugenics, because like when you see like closeted eugenic arguments in modern or even post Nazi times. It's always been like, Oh, wouldn't it be great if like, imagine we could have an entire generation of Einsteins and Mozarts. Like if we could selectively choose the traits that we pass down to our children. Right. And like we could advance to a thousand years. And like, it's another thing that makes me uncomfortable with this movie is just like, and ultimately it decides against it, which is a good thing. Um, but like it does present these children's as, yeah, children as monsters. Well, I'm glad you said that because I was yeah. literally about to lead into that. Okay, I was saying cool. the fact of their pale blonde hair, you know, and their precociousness. Um, it, it, I mean, this movie is made in 1960. Like it does sort of call to mind some imagery, maybe of like a Hitler youth thing, you know, and the idea that they sort of view humans as lesser than right or they're they sort of act in a way that is separate from humanity they're part of their own community right and the only reason that george sanders can actually interact with them is that he seems to be the only character who has a certain degree of respect for their intelligence which is why they even bother like having any sort of back and forth communication with him at all to any degree even though, like, in this scene, they don't tell him, obviously, that they're obviously aliens. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but they are honest enough to tell him that they can read his mind, you know? And while it's limited right now, where we'll be able to see everywhere into your mind soon, so don't. Yeah. And I do think it's, I, I think the Nazis connection is maybe not super far-fetched. The idea that they're using a certain type of imagery of this new generation that is like different and deviant. Um, but also at the same time 
incredibly intelligent. It's not like get you know pull your pants up around your waist, right? It's like oh no, they're focused and organized, and they're going to infiltrate us, you know. And because of their bizarre sort of abnormal reproduction, I think it does sort of call like raise a sort of uh, I don't know awareness in the back of your mind of eugenics. So I think it's not too far fetched to suggest that this movie is calling back to like, you know, Hitler youth or like Nazi imagery in that way, which in ultimately should just go further to say how reactionary this movie really is. The idea of like, you know, anxieties over a new generation and uh, teenagers existing as a concept for the first time, you know, they're not Nazis. <laughs> That you know. Maybe this, maybe the book started off instead of uh, Midwich Cuckoos, it was just uh, I was cucked by a Nazi. <laughs> and then the publisher wouldn't do that. It's, it's just like, okay, whatever. Oh man, not Nazi punks cuck off. Is that what it is? <laughs> How many times can I do it, Max? Enough to make me want to jump off your balcony, Austin. <laughs> Now, I think this is maybe the first occurrence in which they actually. Uh, no, this is still self-defense. But I think there's a scene. There's a, like a reaction shot of David after the guy drives into the wall where he's like slight, slight grin. It seems like he's taking enjoyment in it. Well, one of them turns to David's mom so that she doesn't really remember the event. Yeah. Oh no, he hit a box of fireworks in front of his car. Oh, there we go. There's a little bit of flame. It's interesting that she didn't react at all before that, though. But again, it's interesting how in this community we get all these different interactions, right? We now have a new interaction. Look at the guy on the right. <laughs> oh, the guy who looks like he's about to fall asleep. Yeah. But we, we have all these different communal interactions at different levels of the community, whether it's between the person buying stuff at the shop or between a husband and wife or between people at the pub or in this scene between somebody trying to give testimony at a type of trial, a local trial. Um. And the kids subvert the normal working of things at every level, right? So much like them, but in a way that's more interesting and sophisticated than them, the kids sort of infiltrate and contaminate every single sort of ordinary working of this community. And then here's the guy who's clearly been the most emotionally disturbed the entire time. Yeah. This is a town of like 20 people, so you should know him. <laughs> it is interesting that I think they made a comment earlier about how like every woman who uh, had the ability to be pregnant in the town gave birth to them. And then there's only like six of them. Yep. It's like, how fucking big is this town? <laughs> Just sneaking out of a bush to assassinate some kids. Here we go. <laughs> Um, do you think they could, like, if you tried to shoot them, it would work? I think you would have, uh, I think you might have killed one of them, but I think 
Well, they would have gotten you for yeah, sure. The yeah. retribution would have been much He's more He's got severe. like a shotgun. He's not going to hit them from that far away. What does he think? It's like shooting like a pigeon or something? It doesn't definitely has to do with the proximity. And this is the thing where it's like, this is not self-defense. You could argue it still is, though. If they read his mind and they knew he was about to shoot them, they'd probably be like, oh, fuck no, you're not walking out of here. <laughs> Max, do you think this, this movie has any history in the goth aesthetic? No. Are you sure? I think in somewhere in the way, way prehistory of gothism. You mean like Visigoths? Like the people who sacked Rome or whatnot? <laughs> the people who sacked Rome were all just a bunch of kids who convinced everyone in Rome to just light their houses on fire. I mean, there are a lot of Goths with like bleach blonde hair, but I think that's just because the Goth scene really took off in like Germany and whatnot. <laughs> so I don't know. And also, sometimes you get sick of black and want to do something different. That's why my hair is half purple right now. Did that kid have a pin on his collar? Did you see that? Oh, no, it's just a button. Never mind. Ooh. Ah. Yes, we see all these funny reaction shots. Now, Max, what yeah. would you do if you had a kid? Okay. And they started doing this shit. How would you handle it uh, as a parent? Leave. You just leave. <laughs> what would you do with your significant other? Well, like this, like, as we say, like, as he says numerous times, this isn't his kid. <laughs> if I'm him, I'm moving to Paris. Across the English Channel. Starting a new life. Find a new wife at a coffee shop somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Max, for real, though, I'm serious. What would you do? I am serious. You just leave? <laughs> You just leave your significant other to deal with it? That's what, do you nice. Think I, do you think I'm going to put a time bomb inside of my teaching bag and think of a brick wall and hope they don't kill me before the time bomb goes off and kills me? Well, I would hope if it was the right thing to do. I'd just wait for the British government to develop a 70-foot-long nuke thing that could take out. You're not in the UK. You're you're in the US. Still go to France and marry somebody from a pastry shop. Do you let them destroy the US? Yeah. I don't know what I do in that situation. Well, then why did you ask me the question? Because f we're on a podcast. Fuck it. <laughs> Just going to ask you a bunch of questions. Oh, yeah. And here's the ones where the Soviets nukes the town that the kids were in. <laughs> Atomic shell. Yeah. I totally missed that. They tried it out yesterday in Reminsk. You tell me they dropped an atomic bomb on those fucking children. It's weird how they also talk about them as like a contaminant, you know, or like uh, almost like a pandemic, right? Where it's like, oh, you couldn't alert any of the people there to leave without like alerting them. They like... Oh, I think parasite is a very good term to describe them, Max. Um, it's like they attach themselves to the community, and then in order to actually successfully exterminate them, they're like cockroaches. You have to blow up the entire community. A brick wall. You know what, Max? If I had a kid like this, I'd be like, listen, I'll help you destroy the world, but tonight we are going to Las Vegas. Come with me. And I pretend they were just like a put them on a give, give them cocaine for the first time. See what happens. Just get them addicted to drugs or something. <laughs> now you're thinking, Max. Well, the thing is, like, as he said, is like we haven't taught them morality. We haven't taught them emotions. 
Have them have, have give them drugs and see what happens. Just have them make. I wouldn't give them cocaine. I'd give them. I'd start them out with alcohol. Give them acid. See what happens. Just no. go real crazy. No. Oh my god, that'd be awful. They just project their weirdness out on everyone. <laughs> Frankenstein mob happening. Looks like a straight pride parade. <laughs> Just a group of like 10 men <laughs> yeah. walking in clothes that don't fit them properly. Yeah. <laughs> Why did none of their fucking clothes fit them? I said that as a joke, but literally none of their jackets fit. So they're all drunks whose wives have all been cucked. No, they've been cucked. I don't know. If their wives were cucked, I don't think they'd have any <laughs> sort of problem with any of this. Listen, can you be a female cuckold? Yeah. Email us at austinsterns at gmail.com. Um, you can bleep that out. Yeah, I will. Sorry. But the answer is yes. <laughs> totally can. I don't know. I've only ever seen it be used as a male term. Are, is cuckolding sexist? <laughs> I love how the kid just convinces them to light each other on fire. They'll just light this one guy on fire. Oh, they only light this one guy? Yeah. Do you think there's something specific, like specifically like intimidating about English kids in these horror movies? I believe in the omen. He has a, like a type of English accent as well. Well, Damien like doesn't talk at all in the omen. Not really. No. And the, the the ingenious part about the omen, I think, is that like you're kind of sympathetic for Damien for the majority of the movie. Like he doesn't have any real control over this. And it's like he's kind of just there. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not until the end when he smiles at the camera and you're like, oh, you little shit. Which, by the way, yeah, Richard Donner kind of fucked up with that because I remember watching a commentary track of that movie where he said he was trying to keep it ambiguous. Like he had that whole question of like the fantastic and the yeah. marvelous thing. And he wanted to keep it in the fantastic. And it's like, you motherfucker, you can't end the movie with him smiling and have it be. Yeah, it's like, not ambiguous. That's not anymore. how that works. He was the Antichrist. We know. I will say though, Max, it uh, does work as a movie. Sorry, we're talking about the omen, but like that that movie does work amazingly. Ninety nine point nine percent of the movie. <laughs> I think it's a fun movie yeah. as an ambiguous like what what is going on type thing. But. Yeah, that movie also has some interesting uh, sort of similarities to the sequel of this movie, Children of the Damned, which is also not too bad. But the idea is like the children. It it almost seems to be more of like a strategic approach by these aliens where they impregnate like wives of ambassadors. And then it's like, Oh, the fact that this hive man mind is like implanting itself in these important, like political positions all over the globe. So there's more of like a geopolitical context. That's only like deeply in the subtext of this one. Um, and that one is more of like part of the point of the second one. And of course the omen, because actually the same thing, it's the, you know, son of an ambassador, Right. He, Gregory Peck is an ambassador in that movie, right? He holds yes. some government position. He yeah. is an ambassador, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I think it's interesting to compare this with the other really notable like instances of like evil children in ho like horror movies. And I would exclude maybe like certain Japanese movies from that because it seems to be relying on some sort of past tradition of it more. Like it's inheriting maybe something more from. Yeah. I mean, like stuff like the grudge in the ring is different, but. I would say um, an another very interesting example of evil children from just a few years earlier than this is the movie called The Bad Seed. I don't know if you've ever seen that. That one's interesting because it's a very different approach to like. I don't know. uh how they present their evil where in that one, it's like a, it's a, someone who it's a child who performs their childness. If that makes sense, they perform their like child status to perfection, but they use it to manipulate, you know, 
and they do bad things because they're a bad seed, but they're constantly manipulating. They're constantly tricking people with their bright smile and their like vivacious energy and their like lust for life, right? But it's all just this mask to like get what they want. Whereas this one is very different. I would say this movie is kind of like, I don't know, it's it's a little bit more uncanny in a Freudian sense, which I'll try to include some definitions of that in the uh, show notes maybe, but because it's a little bit of a messy term, but the idea of unheimlich, it's translated from Germany, uh, from German, um, which is sort of the idea of something that is, uh, something that's close to being what it should be, but qu- isn't quite what it should be is some sort of like a basic idea of the uncanny, the uncanny. So like ideas of the doppelganger are like a perfect example of the uncanny because it's something that's, you know, like you, it's very similar to you. In fact, it's a perfect copy of you, but it isn't you. And therefore it's highly disturbing or at the very least, very weird. Max, if you met a complete copy of yourself physically, how weird would that be? And they Um, even had the same dyed hair. Uh, can I have sex with it? No, because they're not you. You don't know if they're bi. Okay, well, I'll ask them. Sure. I mean, you could ask them. Wouldn't you have sex with a clone of yourself? No. Why? Because I'm straight. Well, one, that seems like a you problem. And two, just saying. Be something to try. I don't know. I don't it's, think it's not any more gay than masturbating, Austin. It's not like the fact of it being gay. It's just that I'm not, I would not be into myself. You're missing out, man. That's all I'm saying. (laughs) And then we have the colonial language again, by the way. We're going to form new colonies. Why the fuck is he wearing like an expensive outfit? I just want to see these uh, like a movie of these kids in high school. I think they're the he was planning on going out to like the theater or something with his wife. Oh yeah. Speaking of going to high school in like awkward teen years, another weird thing about this movie or uh, like a supposedly weird thing about these kids that, you know, places them as a threatening other is the way in which their sort of visual conformity sort of confuses gender performance as well. You know, it's like this weird semi obliteration of gender roles. Another way in which they're kind of similar to the ants and them, you know, and also Uh, coupled the ants and them had gender roles. Well, there's a queen. The Queens were the only important ones. Yeah. But, I mean, that's, like, bare bones. Aside from that, it's like they're just automatons, you know? Whereas in this one, it's, you know, they're still barely performing gender, but not really trying that much. It's just basically a difference in hair length, which is kind of just decided by their parents anyway, I guess. Oh, and here he's saying goodbye to his wife. How romantic. Oh, before he blows himself up. Spoilers. Anybody who doesn't want spoilers for Village of the Damned, skip to this time code. Zero, 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 zero. Movie's almost over. I think we only have like five or so minutes left. I know. This movie does move. Wraps up really quick. And also, if you want to play a drinking game with us for the last five minutes of this movie, uh, take a shot every time he says the word brick wall. And brick wall. <laughs> brick wall. It almost looks like he's transforming into a brick wall. <laughs> Maybe at some points. Because they I do the fade he, for so yeah, long. I believe you said he was turning into the thing from the Fantastic Four. Yes, that would be great. You can't hurt <laughs> He just starts punching wall. the kid. <laughs> <laughs> he's just throwing them against the wall. Oh, man, that would be funny.
Do you think it'd be cool to see like outrageous violence against kids in movies? I'm talking about out, as be. outrageous. Yeah. Yeah. As the thing throwing them against the wall. Yeah. And then like turning to obvious dummies as you like comically throw them. In the wall. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that's great. But. And then cut to a kid like screaming and they're like, you do like, you get like Tom Savini to do like effects of them with like half their bodies ripped off. <laughs> Honestly, that would be kind of amusing. I would love to see that in like the final new dumbass Jurassic world movie. Kids no, just get the like next one is going to be called Jurassic universe. It's going to be dinosaurs in space. It could never be that exciting. Didn't they do something with the last one where it's like a dinosaur human? Uh, no, but they made the dinosaur clone like as intelligent as a human. So it can like open cages and like pick locks or whatnot. It can it do my taxes? <laughs> Is it smart enough to wear a fucking mask in the coronavirus? That's what I want to know. Uh, that's too smart. That makes it smarter than half of Americans. Uh, I hate this fucking country. That's why we make fun of you, England, because our country is so fucking shit. That we We're fuck going down together. Yeah. You birthed us. You, you to created us <laughs> like some sort of weird space alien. <laughs> Like Frankenstein's monster going back to our creator and just like, why did you make us? <laughs> why? <laughs> Brick wall. Oh, last the time dog. I can say, good boy. Okay, here's a little plot hole for you. They tell the dog, he tells the dog, go see your, and he says, old man. No, look at, you can't come. Look after your mistress. She's in London. No, I know, but the dog kind of knows what's happening and just lies down and looks sad oh i thought the dog went with him to the no. house okay. okay i was like is the dog gonna run out look how sad he is he's like oh should have fixed him some fucking food well hey she comes back anyway so the dog is fine i hadn't seen this in a long time though so i did have to double check does the dog die.com because i didn't want like the dog to try to bite the kid and the kids use my because that's like a stereotypical horror movie formula yes of like you the animal dies first yeah. to show that there's a threat and then you can escalation of after. stakes yeah yeah it's always the most lazy thing too it's interesting they did it because it would be a very easy move for this movie you yeah. know to show like again that domestic struggle upending like a type of nuclear family oh of course they got a dog well oh god the dog is gonna get it you and know? also the dog is taking attention away from the child when they're young maybe so as a threat, the child eliminates the dog. Or the dog just knows that they're like Terminator babies. and is Well, yeah, the dog is barking at the yeah. kid initially. Honestly, I think it... Do you think it would be more realistic if the kids got in a fight with a cat? Because the cat was more like, pay attention to me. Right? And then the cat just like was angry at the kids. That's what the if, real what battle. What if cats I are see. just immune to their mind powers? Oh, what if cats are actually just aliens? Yeah, they kind of are. I'm sure there's an ancient aliens episode on that where it's just like the, cats from space. The Egyptians worshipped cats. Did they know something we didn't? Probably. Here's a guy with weird hair to tell you that cats are aliens. Andrew Lloyd Webber is a fucking alien e Egyptologist. <laughs> That's why he wrote cats. It's a secret coded message. Because Andrew Lloyd Webber shot the moon landing. I think George Sanders' uh, reaction shots here are like hilarious, where he's like sweating, trying to think of a brick wall. A brick wall. A brick wall. Have you ever thought of one thing so hard that you were sweating? Well, like, that's the thing. Whenever, like, this happens a lot. Whenever like telepathy things, it's a big X Men thing. It's just like, oh, I have to maintain my mental mental fortress. That's physically impossible. Your brain can't do that. Like, right? Your brain is thinking of so many different things at any given time. Like, you can't just be like, I am only going to think of this. The only way he could have done it maybe is like to drop acid. Yeah, that would have maybe fixed it because the kids would be like, oh, what the fuck is this? Why is why are you thinking of a squid skateboarding while smoking a joint? <laughs> is this our so escape stupid. plan out of here that you promised? I don't know how that's gonna work. Unless the squid is a metaphor. <laughs> I 
We even get a reaction shot of the dog. That's and funny. And the priest who we haven't seen since the beginning of the movie. Yeah. Oh, look at that model. I love it. Yeah, just tiny little flames. So yes, George Sanders ends the movie by deciding that the risk is too great and the children must be destroyed. Of course, we have this weird ambiguous ending where, like you said, that the eyes sort of like zoom away as if the aliens will regroup and try again. Yeah. So weird ending. We don't know. Interesting movie, though. And I think it it in this movie, it captures a lot of those weird details of like, you know, children in horror movies, even though there's a, there's a large sampling to choose from. So there's obviously a lot of variants. But, you know, like the idea of a abnormal reproduction process, the idea of blurring gender roles, the idea of making the parents superfluous through self-sufficiency and through sheer precociousness. These are all things that, you know, appear and reappear in the child. The dog, stuff. Bruno. Okay, Bruno, you're a good boy. Bruno. Love that. But yeah, so I think it's just another really interesting movie to do. Um, it's just like a fun genre movie. 15, you know, an hour and 15 minutes. It's not no, much of your day. No time at all. Not yeah. even 90 minutes. You got this. Yeah. So go watch Village of the Damned. It's a I, grand old time. Yeah. Like, I don't want to sound like I'm coming down to like, I don't know, like lukewarm on this. Like, it's a fun movie. No, it's good. Like, good ideas. But it's just like not, not every movie can be a 10 out of 10 or a zero out of 10. Some movies are just pretty good. It's it's worth watching. Yeah. And I want to say, like, I think it's in its concept and everything. It's very smart and interesting. I just there's not a lot. It's not like a roller coaster ride, but, you know, it's just like a decent time. No, so. well, that's also the the kind of downside of having a short movie is like, yeah, there's no fat and it gets right to the point. But like, there's no time to there's not that much time to get fully invested in this world. And yeah. Like, there's some things they could have exor- like expanded upon a little bit more, but it's a solid film. I enjoyed it. Yeah. So yeah, if you want to listen to more episodes, you can find us at spectatorfilmpodcast.com or uh, find our letterbox, which I still do not remember the name of, um, or find our social media <laughs> on Instagram or Twitter. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty sure that's it. Max, do you have anything else to say? You're not thinking of atomic energy, Austin. You are thinking of ending this podcast. Oh, I'm thinking of a brick wall. No. I'm thinking of a brick house. Oh, I'm cutting it off before that. Yeah.